Welcome to Network Security. My name is Jens Mir Pedersen and I'm Associate Professor at Aalborg University. In this course, it's organized in seven small lectures and not from the first one, but for the other six, there will be a short quiz after each lecture. The six lectures will cover uh, malware, information theft and digital theft, click fraud, paper install and spam, DDoS attacks, infections and social engineering, and finally, we will take a look at different kind of attackers. For this video, there is no quiz, so you are welcome to continue to the next video. Second part of network security introduction, where we will be talking about different kind of malware, um, namely ransomware and spyware. And the word malware really comes from two words, malicious and software, which you combine into one. Ransomware is quite nasty because it usually takes control of your computer by restricting access to files uh, or systems. Uh, this is usually done by encrypting either all or some of the files on the hard drive. It requires then the user to pay a ransom before the system can be used again and it can target both users and companies. So it can be both a single computer which is locked but it can also be a large system attack where several servers with business critical information is left inoperationable. And that can be really critical for a business, so more businesses than you might think actually choose to pay. Of course, the, the, the criminals behind it are trying to build up a, a business where they have a high reputation, so it increases the likelihood that people will pay if they believe they will actually get access to their files back. So one of the things they can do is that they can offer that you can send them one or two of the encrypted files and they will decrypt it for you just to demonstrate that they do have the key and the ability to do so. So here is an example of what a screenshot can look like where you are requested to pay. Um, it can also be that you have to pay it in, in bitcoins, which is an, a more anonymous way of transferring the money. Um, we also have other kind of malware, for example, spyware, where spyware is often monitoring the activities of the user without him or her knowing it. And this information can, can then be used for different, um, for different things. Uh, one thing it can be used as is that it can be used uh, to harvest private information such as email addresses, login and credit card numbers, which can be sold. But it can also be used to monitor internet activity in order to optimize the ads that the person receives. Um, the spyware can be either an, a standalone program that the user installs, for example, by visiting a malicious website, which will install it on his computer. But it can also be, be something that the user downloads himself as a part of, for example, free software. So if you're downloading a free video editing software without knowing the origin, it might very well be infected by some, with some kind of spyware. Uh, that was the end of this um, second lecture. So now please take quiz number one before you continue. Thank you for listening. In the third part of the network security introduction, we'll be looking at information theft or digital theft. When it comes to information theft, there are many different kind of, kinds of information that hackers or attackers can steal. It can be, uh, for example, credit card numbers. It can be login to different uh, systems. Uh, it can be any kind of data that has a value. Um, sometimes they, this information is then used to gain access to bank accounts, which is what I have called digital theft. If that is done, then, you need, then the attacker will also need to do something additional in order to hide what he has actually been doing. So somehow he has to, to get out of the, the traceable transactions. We'll be talking about that on the next slide. Um, often information theft is a result of hacking into larger centralized systems. So it's not just for kids, but it's really advanced persistent threats where you have a specific target that you really want to attack, a, a database that you really want to get into, etc., and then you can work your way into it. There are many well-known cases of this. For example, uh, information about more than 50 million credit card numbers were leaked from uh, Home Depot in 2014. Another example is that um, 
attackers succeeded in getting into the Danish Register of Social Security Numbers, where they got access to almost all Danish social security numbers, which are otherwise considered confidential. Uh, there is a good Danish example on, on digital theft, uh, which was in the news a couple of years ago. Uh, so the names, the names are, are real, at least the Danish names. So Stefan from Denmark is looking for a girlfriend on the internet, and there he meets uh, Russian Elena Petrova. And they exchange a lot of email, emails, they are very much in love, and at some point she would of course like to come and visit him. But there is a problem because she has no money. But fortunately she has a rich uncle which can help. So he can send her the money, but she has no bank account. So instead the uncle will transfer the money to Stefan, who can then transfer the money to Elena through Western Union. And Western Union is such an, a non-traceable transfer that we discussed about before. So one transferred, so Stefan is waiting for the money to get into his account. And when the money is on his account and he can see it, then he goes to the bank, take out the money and transfer them to Elena. What he doesn't know is that the money are actually stolen from another person, another Danish person, Annette, by theft from her net bank. So what the criminals have done is that they have transferred the money from uh, Annette's account to Stefan's account. That's a traceable transaction. And then Stefan has taken out the money and in this non-traceable transaction transferred them to Elena or who it is that, uh, that is placed in, in Russia. And of course, N Stefan never sees his money again. So that is an example of how mules are used. Um, so I will try to go through this, uh, this figure in a bit more detail. So mules are those who take the money from uh, the bank and take them out Take it, take it out in cash, for example, and then go to Western Union or go to somewhere else and do the, the non-traceable transaction. So in the case on the figure here, uh, the mules are hired, so they are paid, but they can also be tricked into it, as was the case with Stefan. Um, then they gain access, then they have their bank accounts, which are genuine, genuine enough. Either they have them already or they establish these bank accounts. Once established um, and in place, then the cyber criminal can breach another account, for example, a Netis account, and then uh, wire transfer these to the, um, to the mule accounts. So that's a completely normal bank transfer. But then the mules will take out the money and do, um, do the transaction. This is step number five in the figure. So the, the mules will take out the money from their bank and, and go in cash and transfer them, for example, through the wire, through the... Um, non-traceable Western Union service. And they then transferred the money to the criminal accounts, where so there is no link between the criminal accounts and then the criminal activity that he did. When we're talking about information theft, I will also mention industrial spionage. Uh, this is a wide area, it's conducted in many ways, and it's also conducted by many different people. So that can be both nation states spying on each other, or it can be uh, companies stealing information from each other. So often this is done by hacking into systems, taking advantage of um, security flaws that might be, or it can be an insider uh, who is sitting inside their organization and has right to, um, to share information with outsiders, or at least has the right to access information. It can also be done by installing malware through botnets or social engineering, so the malware is actually the software that is doing the spying. Um, it's my impression that there are many untold stories about industrial spionage because those who are victims don't want to tell about it. But there is a famous example from Nokia some years back um, where, where the criminals managed to get actually several million euros from Nokia. And this money were, were, trans were given to Nokia, handed over to Nokia in a parking lot close to the Nokia's head offices. Um, I would also say that industrial espionage is really can be an advanced case of information theft. If you want to know more about the Nokia case, you can Google more and read about it. So this was the end of the third lecture. So now please take quiz number two. Thank you. I welcome to part four of the network security introduction. In this part, I will talk about click fraud, paper install, and spam. 
I'll start with click fraud. And what is important to understand is that where we click is really an important part of internet economy. That is, for example, the case when it comes to search engines. So, so assume that I search for a particular word, let's say um, paper, and then afterwards I click on, on a specific link in Google. Then Google learns that, that for that search term, um, this link was a good choice. So if there is often that people have uh, that people are clicking on a specific link for a specific search word, that word will increase its um, its visibility in Google, so it will become higher and higher. But assume I have a problem because I have some website that I would like to be associated with paper, but my website is on number page seventeen in Google. Then one way of increasing it could be to have a lot of people. Not only me, not only one one traceable computer, but computers all over the world to search for paper and click on that specific link. And this is this is what I can try to do with um, click fraud, where, for example, a scripts or programs installed in clients all over the world are doing this, so it looks like a, a genuine behavior. Um, another another case of click fraud uh, relates to ad advertisements like links um, or banners. Uh, so, for example, I could have a website where I have a number of banners and every time someone is clicking one of my banners, I earn a specific amount of money. And if I can, if I can pay uh, or infect other computers to visit my website and click on that banner, then, I, then that can be a business for me. So often this kind of click forward is performed by computers infected with uh, malware or, or botware. Um, another kind of crime is paper install. Um, so let's say that a criminal might want to have a particular software malware installed on a number of computers belonging to other people. So it could, for example, be this kind of malware that is able to open a browser and click on a specific link. Um, uh, but it, could, it can be many things. It can also be a small program that is creating bitcoins, or it could be a program that is uh, storing some data that you would like to have, have stored, but you don't want it on your own computer, then by having it installed, your little program in a lot of computers all over the world, you could push your data to be there. Um, so paper install is really a business model where that a person can buy installations from a cyber criminal. So if I want these installs to be performed, then I would contact the cyber criminal and I would say, I would like my program to be installed in let's say 1,000 different computers, and then I will pay him per installation of my program. Again, botnets can be used for, for this kind of activity. Finally, there is spam, and I don't think spam needs much of an explanation, but it's important to understand that here also hijacked or infected computers can be used. If you're sending out spam, spam from a centralized machine, probabilities are very high that it will be blocked at some point. So if you can attack a machine and you can take over the control of that machine, then you can use it for sending spam, at least for a while, until it's blocked. Again, you can also use botware, botware for this. So thank you for listening, and now it's time to take quiz number three. Welcome to Network Security Introduction Part 5, where I will be talking about DDoS attacks or Distributed Denial of Service attacks. As the name indicates, when we have a distributed denial of service attacks, um, it's a denial of service attack, meaning that we are leaving the attack machine or the attack system so that, that it cannot, so that it is unavailable and it cannot perform the duties that it would normally perform. This is most often done by sending a lot of requests from all over the world, so that is why it's, why it's called distributed, so sending a request to that machine uh, all at the same time. This can be a legitimate request, for example, for a website, or it can be um, a illegitimate request. It really doesn't matter. The thing is that the server or the system will receive so many requests that it's unable to answer them. Um, this, uh, such an attack will usually be centrally coordinated, uh, but it doesn't have to be in real time. So it can be that you have control of a lot of machines and you're telling them at that time, at that particular time, send these kind of requests to that particular machine and they will all be attacking at the same time. Quite often these are 
uh, this can be quite heavy, so it can be between 50 and 100 gigabits per second, but you can see reports of, of, uh, of attacks with up to 400 gigabit of data per second, so that's really a large amount of data. In the figure here, you can also see um, a sketch of how it can be done. So you have the attacker, which is standing behind it all, who through a number of handlers is taking control of all the zombies who are then attacking the victim at the same time. There are a couple of, of recent examples. Um, there are the big examples like Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, who has been attacked. But, but there is also a story about a Danish, um, a Danish school where the school kids they didn't want to, to, uh, to do a national test that all school kids in Denmark have to do. So they decided to launch a DDoS attack on their school at that particular time and day. And in fact, they managed to, uh, to interrupt the, the exam and the test not only at their own school, but in 27 schools. And they managed to lay down a total of 7,000 computers. And these were just school kids who, who managed to buy it online. And when talking about buying it online, it should be noted that it's actually quite cheap to do and it's very easy to do. Um, so uh, there are different sites, I will not mention any names, where you can go and then you can really uh, pay by credit card or by bitcoins. And then you just click and you can launch your attack, decide how many computers uh, should participate in the attack. Uh, so how large a cannon you're shooting with and also how long time it should take to do it. And, and one, of the, one of the challenges with this kind of attacks is that it's really, really easy to do and it's very hard to, to mitigate. So now it's time to take quiz number four. Thank you very much for following. Welcome to part six in the network security introduction. In this part, we'll be talking about infections and social engineering. So there are different ways to infect users with different kind of malware that we, uh, that we have discussed in the previous presentations. Here we'll cover some of the more important ones, namely drive-by infections um, and infections by running executable files. I will also describe something about social engineering and phishing. Um, so drive-by infections happens when the user is visiting a website. Uh, the con computer can be infected simply by visiting this, this website, so it doesn't have to, to do anything active. It doesn't have to download or install any execu executable files. There are different kinds of these websites. Some websites are made specifically with the aim of making an infection, and then you have the challenge in getting the users to these uh, malicious websites. But it can also be that you have completely legitimate websites which are infected by a third party, for example, because there is an unpatched vulnerability in that server. Um, yes. Uh, some well-known examples of the latter is actually there was a WordPress example, and if you want more details, you can Google it. Um, the problem was that there were 100,000 Word um, WordPress sites that were comp compromised in December 2014 because they were using an outdated version and before they were unpatched, uh, criminals managed to infect um, all these machines. Then you have infections through executable, so you have ex executable files that you are downloading or getting in different way. It can be by email, through social media, on a USB disk, or simply downloaded from a website. And often, if, if you have an antivirus program installed, it will give you a warning but the problem with this kind of warning is that the users tend to overwrite them. Um, in my opinion, also because the information they receive is not sufficient for them to make a decision. Um, and actually, this is leading us to the next topic, which is social engineering. Social engineering is all about tricking the user to do some something actively. For example, actually actively accepting to run infected files or, um, or scripts. And it's a kind of confidence trick where you try to gain the confidence of the user and then uh, trick him into doing something. And I think there are two important factors to mention here. One is that the user often doesn't have enough knowledge to know how to act when he sees a security warning. And secondly, the, the user decision might be impacted by the context, such as who is the sender, what kind of content is provided, and how personal is it. 
So somebody somebody managed to have spyware on your computer so they know a lot of about what you're doing or you have been traveling and they can tell you, yeah, now that you're back from our hotel, please go to our website and fill in something. Um, yeah, that can also be part of the trick. Um, the thing is with antivirus, if the user can overwrite it, it's all about tricking him into actually overwriting it, for example, to install a file. And there is one example here that um, the user is receiving a message on Facebook about watch this funny video. As soon as the user clicks on the video and is focused on the video, he receives the warning that he needs to update Flash Player. And Flash Player is something that we are so used to just updating that many users will try to, cl to click run here instead of saying no, which would be the, the good choice. So based on the yes, uh, then, then the user actually gives uh, permission to install this, uh, this piece of malware. And there is another example here, which I will, do, which I will just show you. So that's a, small, that's a very short introduction to um, social engineering. Then we have phishing. And phishing is not strictly related to malware, uh, it's an, but it's an important, an important part of the overall cybercrime picture, where it's about tricking the, the user to provide different kind of information. So the idea is that you are tricking people to disclose private information, which could be social security numbers, credit card information, credential for authentication services such as the Danish uh, digital identity, uh, access to email accounts, social media sites, etc. Uh, and it comes in many forms. That could be emails, websites, and so on. Um, and probably you have you have seen some examples already, like you receive an email from an administrator, please verify your account by sending us your username and password and so on. And if you are sending out this kind of information to a sufficient amount of people, you will always see that someone is being tricked into it. So here's an example of a phishing email from a Danish a payment provider, where for example you can see that the, the sender doesn't really fit well the bill. Um, another example from PayPal, which highlights some of the, the typical things you will see in phishing. For example, that there is a generic reading, uh, that there is a false sense of urgency. So you're told someone just did something or it seems that you have, have uh, bought something. Please go to your account if it wasn't you. So, uh, so some information that is trying to, to, um, to get people to click straight away before they really get to think. And then often there will be fake links, meaning that if you try to move, to move the mouse and see what is really on the link, it will be different than what the link points to. And again, when providing these kind of links, there is often quite a, quite, a, quite a lot of creativity that PayPal could be spelled with a one instead of an L, so it really looks like the same, like the same website. Um, so that was a short introduction to, um, to social engineering and phishing and infections. So now it's time to take quiz number five and then continue with the last part of the introduction afterwards. Thank you very much for following. Hello everyone and welcome to the last part of the network security introduction. This is part number seven where we'll be looking at the different kind of attackers. So the reason for looking at different kind of attacks is really to understand better who is our enemy and when we know our enemy and his motivations, abilities and resources, then we can also build a better defense. So I will go briefly through six different groups of attackers, namely insiders, cyber criminals, script critters, grey hats, hacktivists and nation states, and these have uh, six very different groups. So what we can see in the overview here is we can see that uh, insiders is a small group working either for revenge or profit. We can see that cyber criminals, who are that's a large group, and they are mainly interested in doing things for profit. We can see hacktivists, who are more looking for for curiosity or having a political goal, um, recognition. We are seeing the smallest group I have put here is the script kiddos, so the guys sitting down in the basement, um, drinking cola eating pizza and trying to do what they read off the net and usually they don't get get anywhere with that. Then we have the group of grey hats which are again more for curiosity and recognition and we have a large group of nation states so that's usually states spying on each other for curiosity or revenge. So understanding if, if you are 
most um, potential attacker would be a nation state or for profit or a hacktivist is quite an important part of your defense. So insiders are trusted people with a malicious intent. So that could be the guy who is being fired from his work and still have access. Um, they have pretty privileged access and often knowledge of relevant systems. Um, so this can be motivated by revenge, for example, this guy being fired or being uh, disagreeing with someone. Uh, it can also be motivated by profit because you can get a lot of money by sharing data and knowledge with someone from the, from the outside world. Um, when it comes to abilities and insiders can have extensive knowledge of the systems, uh, including knowledge of vulnerabilities, and he might have skills and permissions to hide his activities but he often doesn't have many resources, so often he will be working alone. On the other hand, he will have access to system resources. We have the cyber criminals who are really the, the professionals, I would even say often organized professionals. They are often organized in groups of hackers and they have a business approach, so they are in it for the money. Um, it's completely financially motivated. Um, they. There are many different groups and there is a wide variety of the technical and skills um, and uh, if they are organized enough they are willing to recruit or hire people with additional competences. Uh, this is often done through underground networks and you will learn much more about that in the, um, in the basic part of this course. Um, when it comes to resources they have plenty of resources available in terms of money, equipment and manpower. So it's a, it's a strong tr group to be up against. And we have also seen how they have been able to launch, for example, a sophisticated um, ransomware attacks. The other script kidders, which are the novices with low skills and a very limited understanding of the technical consequences of what they do. So often they find something on the internet and they try it out. They are usually just curious. They don't have many technical resources. Uh, they have... Um, um, low technical competence and not very many resources. They are often not a part of a larger network, but they're sitting in a basement operating uh, on their own. Then we have the gray hats, which are the old hackers. So often they are, they are skillful hackers and, and usually they don't have a, have a criminal intent. So they are main, mainly curious and, and they are not likely, likely to do, for example, sabotage. Um, often they are specialized and they uh, can be part of networks with information exchange between them, which can make them quite capable. Um, they mainly work alone, despite of this knowledge exchange, so they don't have many resources, but they often have skills and they often have access to some kind of equipment. And the activist, which is a big group, you might know the most famous, and that's also the picture I put here, which is Anonymous. They are often in groups, um, often distributed geographically and with varying, varying technical skills. Um, they are often motivated by ideology or political agendas. Um, often revenge is not a motivation in, in itself, but there can be a, a, a political or ideological reason for, for wanting revenge for something. Um, we have, regarding the abilities, we have seen that uh, they have um, it's very, it's very different from group to group, but you will see that some groups, groups have quite skilled members, and again, Anonymous is a good example of that. Uh, the amount of resources varies a lot from group to group. There will be some which have a few resources and some who has a lot of resources and plenty of manpower. Um, we also know that some of them, such, yeah, um, such as Anonymous, also have botnets and other um, important resources available. Then there is, at last but not least, nation states, which are countries. Um, so they are known, uh, we know that nation states or representatives uh, have tried to perpetrate everything from industrial espionage or military activities to having a nationwide, att a nationwide attacks in the cyber arena. Um, so the motivations can be different, there can be revenge, it can be intelligence, or it can be political or military gains. Um, we know that many nation states have substantial presence in cyberspace and, and have highly skilled experts. And we also know that many of them have a lot of resources. Uh, I would also say here that nation states is of course a very different thing. 
than, than some of the cyber criminals. So where cyber criminals, okay, there are cyber criminals who have a specific target because they can earn a lot of money on that particular target, but often nation states will be will not shoot to everything and then try to catch something like the spam mails or the, the ransomware which is running on a lot of computers, but they are really targeting a specific um, a specific goal and, and trying to find all the vulnerabilities. So in that sense, being being a victim of a nation state is very different than being a victim a victim of some uh, crim criminals who just have an economic gain. And that was the final part of this presentation. So now please do quiz number six. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and welcome to the basic part of network security. My name is Jens Schmier Pearson, I'm from Aalborg University. In this part I will give you a uh, knowledge of the common threats, which we were also looking at in the introductory part. I will try to provide you with knowledge of botnets, including the botnet lifecycle, botnet architectures, and something about how we can track, detect and mitigate the botnets. And that is the main part of this, um, this basic part. And then also I will cover knowledge of the motivation and business models behind cybercrime. This course is organized so that there are uh, nine quite short lectures, around five minutes. And then after each lecture, there is a quiz with self-assessment. And then at the end of the whole basic part, there will be an additional quiz. So when we look at a botnet and what is a botnet, um, the easiest way is actually to see it on the figure, but I have included this slide as well, so you can go and read more about it if you, if you want it as a reminder. But if we look at the, um, the figure, what we can see is that we have a botmaster who has infected a number of um, zombies, which are here called bots, with a kind of specific um, botware or malware. And what he can do then is that he can actually control these machines and use them for different kind of malicious purposes. So that could be, among other things, email, uh, spam. Also use the computer for stealing information. That could be personal information, uh, credit card information. It could be having access to, for example, a webcam or a microphone. Um, or it could simply be to install a keylogger and monitor everything that is going on on the machine. And uh, finally, he can also use the bot as a part of a, an uh, for example, a DDoS attack, so the machine can take part in, in DDoS attacks at a certain point in time. Uh, what is important to keep in mind is that while I show here a very simple architecture, in fact, it can be more complicated so that there is no direct communication between the botmaster and each uh, zombie, which makes it a lot harder to take down the botnet and to uh, to find the botmaster eventually. It's um, uh, it's also important to say that you can actually use the botnet for different things. So first, you might use it for stealing personal information. And when there is no more personal information of any value, then you can go to the next step and use it for spamming or DDoS attacking, with where there is a higher probabil probability that you will be caught at some point. But we'll get back later on to, uh, to how that works. It's important also to say that the owners of zombies are often unaware of these kind of infections. Um, so they don't know that there is something running on their computer. Um, uh, a word on that about these infected computers is that the user of something might not notice that the computer is infected. And often these programs are made really good to remain stealth, so you don't see it. Um, uh, one way of seeing it could be that there can be network activity when it's not expected. There could be uh, very small amounts of traffic, so you cannot detect it, or it can be large amounts of traffic, such as when you participate in a DDoS attack. It could also be increased CPU load when certain malicious activities are carried out. For example, if you use the, um, the zombie for, for calculating bitcoins or similar, uh, and it could be increased network load when you have, for example, these DDoS attacks or distribution of spam. For now, please go to quiz number seven and then uh, see you here in a minute. Welcome to the second part of network security. Here we will be looking a bit more into what botnets are actually being used for. So as we discussed before, botnets can be used in most uh, types of cybercrime. So that includes information theft, installation of malware, spam, click fraud, and participation in DDoS attacks. Uh, once a zombie is infected, 
It's often used for multiple kind of malicious activities, with the most valuable uh, activities carried out first. We also discussed that um, that before. Uh, in the intro in the introductory part, we saw an example where money was stolen from a bank and then transferred to a third party, who was tricked to take out the money and go to Western Union, and then uh, uh, he uh, or she lost the money. Uh, actually, this principle is worth taking a little bit more elaborate look at to understand how these kind of mules are often used in uh, in this kind of crime. So where you see them are, are not only uh, when you're tricking people to do something, it can also be an idea, Nigeria letters, uh, which you might have heard of, where someone is uh, offering to send you a very large amount of money, and then you have to take out this money or do something with them and send them on to a third part, and you can keep part of it. But what often happens is that what you are supposed to do is that you are taking the money out so uh, the money can be uh, transferred electronically to you. This is a traceable transaction. Then the money are taken uh, out by you, for example, in cash, given to Western Union, where it cannot be traced anymore. So the traces stop at you, the electronic traces stop at you, and then, uh, of course, these money are from different kind of crime, and then you are the one helping to get them out to the to the criminals. Another scam like this can be second-hand buyers, uh, where someone is uh, advertising something in a, as a second-hand um, advertisement. Uh, so if you're trying to sell your old table, then you're contacted by a person who will give a lot of money for it, uh, and you will say, yes, of course, I can ship it to England or another country. Uh, when the money arrives in your account, you will notice it's too much money. He will contact you and say, ah, could you please, I by mistake, I transferred too much money. Could you please tr transfer this money back to me? And when you uh, do that transaction, usually it's again a non-traceable transaction. So that's how it's done. And this is also what we see in this figure, where we can see that in the first step, uh, you hire mules or you recruit mules. In this example, um, you hire them, so simply pay them to do it. And then you have the cyber criminal who in step two, so in step two, the mules will establish these accounts. So now they are available to use for the cyber criminal who can then make a bridge on a on some account or whatever kind of, a, yeah, usually that's the activity or to steal them from some kind of account, then transfer them to the mules newly established accounts in step four then they are spread out to the different mules. They might keep part of the money, uh, and then they take out the money, um, transfer them via the transfer service, which is non-traceable, that's step number five, to the criminal's account, and who can then take out the money. Uh, so maybe he will only get 90%, but on the other hand, he's the guy here who is safe because he, he got the money in a, in a non-traceable way. Um, what is also important to keep in mind is that often we are talking about organized crime here. So we have uh, so uh, many of the large botnets, botnets are run really as a, as hardcore criminal business. So uh, one of the one of the main uh, persons are of course the botmasters who offer different kind of services. So you have a customer at the end, the customer who might want to buy a DDoS attack or who want to want to buy a number of credit card numbers or personal sensitive information about one or more persons, he can contact the botmaster and then they agree about the price for doing so. Um, and the botmaster is then using his botnets or he can rent uh, botnets from other people to carry out these activities. We can also see that the botmaster is of, often in the in the in the, you can say in the very professional botnets, has access to support or to developers who are specialized in either spreading uh, the, the, the malware or uh, developing malicious code. Uh, in order to fight the botnets, we often work with a model and then we can, we can use that for kind of discussing where we would like to, to counter the, the botnet and detect that it's present. So there is a phase one where it's born, so the malicious code is developed. There is a phase two, which is the infection that takes place here. So here the malicious code reaches the client and it is either installed itself or, or 
kind of exploit social engineering to let the human user install it. Then there is command and control phase when the client is communicating with the botmaster, but no malicious activity is, as such is taking place. So no DDoS attack, no information stalls, but just the, com the communication uh, from the infected machine saying, I'm infected, I'm ready to serve your order. He might receive updates to the code and so on. Um, actually, that's a very interesting phase because there is very little traffic, but also it's here we really would like to to um, to be able to detect what is going on because at this stage we can prevent anything really bad from happening. Then after that phase, there is a phase four, the execution phase, where the client begins to carry out commands which it has received. So that could be here it started to steal information doing DDoS attacks and so on. Finally, the code is disposed, uh, the bot is cleaned, either because the botnet is taken down or because the the infected client has been cleaned. Um, based on this, please go to quiz number eight and then see you here in a minute. Thank you so much. Welcome to Network Security, the basic part number three. Here we'll be talking about botnet architectures and I will go through a number of uh, simple but, uh, but good models. Uh, so, of course, the simple models we have is a centralized architecture. Uh, so, what you can think about when looking at, at the figure is what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of this kind of architecture. Um, we also note here that when the CNC server here is shown as being something controlled by the botmaster, but often it will be located in a hacked machine, so the owner is not aware what his machine is actually being used for. This model is very simple, it's not so useful in real life. Uh, first of all, it's not very reliable, since if one of the bots is being taken down or identified, then it's not too difficult to find the command control server and take that down. So we have a single point of failure, and in addition to having a single point of failure, we might also have a situation where it's too easy to identify the bot master. So it, it's a nice, simple model to play with in the basement, but it doesn't really work in real life. In the peer-to-peer -peer architecture, we tried to deal with some of the shortcomings of the centralized architecture that we saw just before. Uh, so here you have a lot of machines who are connected to each other, like uh, connections here and there. Um, it's, it can look pretty unorganized when you look at it. Um, and the idea is that the botmaster can inject commands to one machine, who will then forward this to other machines, who will forward it to other machines again. And as, a, as an infected zombie, you don't know if your command is coming from the botmaster itself or just from another infected machine. So, of course, it's, more, it's here more difficult to trace the CNC server and it's a lot more difficult to shut it down because even if you find a machine, you take it out, the rest will still be, be well connected. On the other hand, um, one of the drawbacks is that it doesn't scale very well. So if you have a very large uh, network, it takes quite some time, or it might take quite some time for information to get from one machine to another machine and finally to the whole botnet. So if it's a really large botnet, um, it's very hard to control it and have people doing things at the same time and to make sure all this, the malware is updated and so on. Um, another model is with changing servers. So that really increases the robustness of the botnet since um, you might have one server in one minute, the minute after you switch to another server, the minute after to another server and so on. So you're always changing the servers that you're communicating with. This is a more uh, difficult architecture to implement because you always need to, to contact new servers, uh, but it makes it a lot harder to shut down the, ser the, the servers and the network. And of course you can combine this with having more than one server, so you have multiple servers running, placed in multiple countries at the same time, making it very hard to, to shut it down, because if one server is down, you can just contact another one, which is in another uh, country or, or region. So I've been going through some simple architectures here. Um, what is important to notice is that often you're using other techniques. I will cover fast flux in the next video to make it even more stealth. Um, also that in fact different architectures are often combined so we have some kind of hybrid architectures. 
often we also see production machines and hurricane kits being used. So not all the zombies are equal, but you can have the zombies in the in the lowest part who are doing the uh, or the malicious activity, then you have a different layer, which is really just working with forwarding information to and from these zombies to another layer to another layer, and you have the the bot master on top of it all. But the distance from the machine carrying out malicious activity to the bot master is really long and can go through different countries and can be really hard to trace it back to the to the bot master. One example uh, that was described by McAfee was an, an attack called Ten Days of Rain where they installed a botnet specifically for this purpose. And afterwards they realized where these where the servers were located and they could see that basically the, um, the servers were located uh, all over the world. There were 39 servers in total distributed uh, between USA, Taiwan, Saudi, Saudi Arabia and a lot of other countries. So in total, these machines were spread out over 14 countries. It's also important to notice that different kind of protocols are used to hide the activities. So standard protocols including IRC, HTTP, so that we use it for web traffic. And also uh, recently we are seeing an increase in using instant messenger and other peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Um, the reason that HTTP is becoming uh, quite popular, while it's quite hard to deploy it, you have so much HTTP traffic that that when you look through a network and you see HTTP traffic, you don't uh, see any alarm bells ringing. Whereas if you would see IRC uh, protocol being used, that might indicate uh, this looks weird. Or some of the other protocols might also not be very widely used and therefore you get suspicious when you see it. And what you also see is that encryption or, or packets looking differently from packet to packet, so you don't have a common pattern to look for. It's also used in order to to avoid being being found and recognized. So for now, please take quiz number nine, and then see you very soon. Hello everyone, and welcome to part four of the basic module in network security. Here I will be giving you a short introduction to FastFlux. But before we start with Firefox, I will show you how DNS works because that's really an important concept to understand before we can start talking about um, Firefox. So when, I, when machines are commu uh, communicating uh, with each other over the internet, what they really use is IP addresses. So when you have uh, an address that you want to look up in a browser, for example, google.com, in order to contact the server, you really need, need to know what is the IP address of google.com. And for this, we have the DNS system. So it works the following way, that when you and your computer, and I made the figure myself, so when you and your computer write google.com, what you do first of all is that you send a, re a request to a DNS server, um, asking what is the IP address of google.com and you get a reply back which is in, in terms of an IP address so in this case the IP address is 130.225.50.23 and then based on that reply you can send an HTTP request to google.com and then send it to that IP address and when you then send your request to that IP address, you get the reply back with the web page that you want to see. So as you can see, DNS is quite crucial in the way the internet works, not only for web browsing, but for all kind of activities where we use domain names, which are made out of real names, which are easy to remember. So let us look at how FastFlux works. So the idea behind it is that the bot master uh, not only has control of the zombie, but also has control of a DNS server, and that is what we see in the figure here. So, first of all, when the client, uh, that he might have hard-coded a number of domains, or might be able to auto-generate uh, domain names, which fit with something that the botmaster is taking control of. So, he might be asked uh, some kind of uh, domain, um, that could be a domain with a real name, but very often it would be some kind of randomly generated domain name that he is asking then the DNS server to resolve. But since the DNS server is also controlled by the botmaster, he get an IP address back, which is then directing him to first of all a proxy machine, and then uh, it could be more proxy machines, but at the end of the day, the malicious server. 
So what is happening is that you can send a, re a request for an IP address and you will get um, get an IP address often with a very short time to live or a number of IP addresses, which are really IP addresses of proxy bots uh, who are then directing you to the command and control server. But uh, this uh, this um, in this DNS response, when the time to live is very low, you will ask again and again about the addresses and you will be sent to different kind of machines all the time. So the fast flux ensures that whatever you are doing, um, that you will be you that yeah that you can change the the um, the proxy or that you can change the malicious server with very short intervals. If you want to know more about this topic, I can recommend that you search for the concepts which are called uh, single flux, double flux, and domain flux, uh, which are more advanced uh, concepts. But this was the first introduction, and based on this first introduction, please go ahead and take quiz number ten. Thank you. In lecture number five, we'll be looking at different detection methods. So basically here we'll go uh, through the many different detection methods and then later on I will go more in depth with the network-based detection. So botnet, botnet mitigation is really challenging because it can be quite difficult to find the command and control servers. And often these, as we discussed before, operate behind different layers of proxies and they are in different countries. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's quite challenging. Um, the different approaches I will go through in this lecture, in my opinion, I would say it's needed to combine them. So we cannot say that one way is going to solve all our problems with, uh, with botnets and malware. Uh, what is important to keep in mind, we discussed the businesses in the introductory part, uh, is that the programmers behind are highly skilled people with access to a large amount of resources and that they put a lot of efforts into not being detected. So we have to do with an enemy who really wants to remain stealth. And so that's one challenge we have. And another challenge we have is that we want to avoid uh, the false positives. So we really need a high detection accuracy because if we detect, let's say, 1,000 machines as infected, but only one of them is it in reality, then uh, our system is basically useless. So we have to be able to say very precisely which machines are infected and not only which are potentially infected. So let's go to the overview of the detection approaches. So the, the first I will mention is what is called what I will call non-network based detection. So a detection which is working on the individual host. So that could be, for example, antivirus programs which can inspect software and, and see what is going on on the on the on the individual host. This can be quite efficient if it is updated and if it is correctly used by the by the users. And there are different problems with them, such as they usually are not good in zero day detection. So they need they can only deal with known threats. So if there is a threat that they have not seen before and which is not included in the in the program yet, um, then it's very hard to uh, to detect it. Also, it it suffers from what is called social engineering. Um, so if human, if you the human people is um, is all ruling it, and if you allow installing a piece of software, even if you receive a warning against it, well, then it doesn't really work that efficiently. And what we see often is that people tend to be easy to manipulate. So um, so whenever you get a warning, you need to update flash players. Quite a lot of people would actually go ahead and do it. Also, in order to be really efficient, it needs to work on, the, on a, not only on the PC platform, but if we, it, it needs to be installed on all network devices. And with Internet of Things coming up, uh, with uh, people being connected to the Internet on the phones, on uh, iPads, um, tablets, uh, computers, all different kind of devices on the Internet, then it's increasingly difficult to ensure that you have updated antivirus on all your devices. Uh, then there are the network-based methods, which include anomaly-based, signature-based, and methods based on statistical traffic anal analysis. So I will just briefly mention these different ones. So there is anomaly detection, which is basically that if you can if you can see that there is a very unusual behavior that could be triggered by a high network latency, or that you see a lot of traffic or a big increase in the amount of traffic 
or traffic on unusual ports, then you say, ah, this looks really is, is suspicious because it's considerably different from normal network traffic. Um, when we're talking about botnets, this is more likely to occur in the last phase where you actually, actually have some malicious activities going on. So a DDoS attack would, tri would trigger this because it's a lot of uh, traffic which looks very specifically and which is very different from your usual traffic. Or it could be the spam because you have a lot of um, uh, emails sent by um, uh, mail servers which you usually wouldn't wouldn't be using. And actually, to some extent, fast logs can also be detected in this way if you are contacting a DNS server, which is different from a DNS server that would usually be used within that particular network. I know that, for example, in Olber University, if we are using DNS servers which are not the DNS servers of the university, then we get a call from the IT asking what is, uh, what is going on. Then moving on to the next slide, we have signature-based detection which is really works by that you look into the content of the of all the packets. So you you need you need to look into the payload or into the uh, patterns of the packets and then look for signatures related to specific malware or specific botnets. Um, again, uh, it's it's hard it's a hard task to do, and especially it's hard if the if the content is encrypted or if you're looking for something which is not yet known. So it suffers from some of the same shortcomings as the host-based. But of course, since it's working in the network, uh, you don't have to install it on all different kinds of, of devices, and it's easier to ensure that it's updated, especially if you are in a professional organization. Then the approach that I would go more to DevSwit, and that we are working more with the Norbert University, is uh, to try to distinguish benign traffic from uh, botnet traffic and malicious traffic by using statistical analysis on the network traffic and we're using um, machine learning algorithms to do so. So this can be really be applied in all places of the network as long as all the relevant data is passing through this point. So even a large amount of data, we try to look into the network traffic and see, can we see that there is something uh, suspicious here? So what we look at is statistical information about the flows and the network flows such as the packet length, the flow length, the number of ingoing packets, number of outgoing packets, port numbers, which countries we're communicating with, or even which continents we're communicating with. But of course, this works only if there is actually a difference. So if you want to see the difference between the malicious and non-malicious activities, we can only do so if there is a difference between them. Um, yes, and this is something which we will also cover in the next videos. Uh, I would also say that what we are doing and what I find to be most interesting is to focus on the command and control traffic because then again we can do something before some re something really malicious is really going on and some harmful, harmful activities are being carried out. So for now, please take quiz 11 and see you soon for the next video. So welcome to part six of the basic module in network security. What we'll be talking about here is network-based detection of malware and botnet activities. So um, when we're talking about network-based detection, we can actually do this in different points in the network. The so most important is that uh, we have uh, traffic uh, coming through this point and we are able to analyze the, the traffic in that particular point. So that could take place in different places. Um, if it is a company, it could play, take place in, in a point from where all the traffic goes to the, to the internet, or it could be traffic uh, even on the internal network. It could be in a home where we have an internet gateway, then install it close to the internet gateway on some, uh, just on the side of it. Or it could be different places, even in ISP networks, um, given that we're able to handle this large amount of data. But it could be all the, all the traffic, for example, which is sent from the ISP to some uh, peering provider. Um, it's important to, to uh, when we're talking about network traffic and saying that we want to analyze network traffic, it's also important to understand what it is that we want to analyze because we can do this at different levels. So we can do it, for example, at packet level. So we look at each individual packet and see is this packet malicious or not. 
we can do it at a flow level. So we look at each different flow and see if the flow is malicious or not. And there's quite different approaches to it, and there's different kind of information that we have available. And just to, do, to illustrate these um, different levels that we can talk about, uh, I can show you a multi-level model for worldwide web traffic, for example. So assume that we are looking for a pattern in, in the behavior. Then what kind of pattern are we looking for? And how can we describe these patterns? So it could be that you are, that you are at an application level, that you are doing web browsing, so you are opening up your browser, uh, you're closing it again, then you don't do anything for a while, and then you start a web browsing session again, and then close it down. But within a web browsing session, actually multiple things can happen. So uh, let's look at an individual uh, session then, um, or what is called here in the figure, a dialogue. So you're looking at one web page. So you take down one web page, then you think for a while, and then you uh, click on the next web page, open another web page, and you think for a while, and then you close it down. So then you can say how long, that, so here the statistical information could be uh, how often do you visit a new website, how long are you staying on the website, and so on. But again, you can go down one more level. So even within this um, web page, you can see that there is different kind of objects on the web page. So when you open a new web page, you will have the whole web page, and then you will download images, uh, videos, uh, text, uh, frames, and so on, content, which is still within the same website. So here you can talk about a session where you have, yeah, uh, downloading the whole web page. And then when you have downloaded it all, then you start this user thing time. So we will, so describing this, um, you can say web browsing session we have here would be very diff, diff, different if you look at it from an application dialogue or session point of view. Um, we can also take a look at a more general level, uh, basically showing the same. So you can say, okay, our connection to the network, how can we, at, at, at which different levels can we observe that? So it could be that you're connected to the network or not connected to the network. That would be the connectivity level. Then you can do, go down to the application level and say, yeah, but now I'm connected to the network and I'm running different applications. So you could be running one application and at the same time you could be running another application. You would stop the first one, you would start another one and so on. So there is an application level and a pattern in that. And within each application, that can be, for example, a client-server dialog, where you have uh, that you are sending some request. It could again be the web page. So you're sending the request for a website. You're waiting for the reply. You're waiting for some time. You're starting up another session where you're asking for a request, uh, asking whatever request and getting a reply back. Within each uh, such session, you would then have um, some data burst. So assume that you are downloading some amount of data. Then you are saying, okay, how much data am I downloading? How long time does it take to download it? But again, within that, you can break it down further and looking at the at the, um, the data packets, for example, how long they are, what are the inter arrival times between them, uh, how many packets is going in one direction, in another direction, um, and so on. So you can look at this at many different levels. Usually what we are doing is that we are looking at flows so we are looking at packets which are sent, be sent between the same pair of machines, so the same IP addresses, um, using the same ports and the same protocol. So if you are doing this within the same session, we would say this is, this is a single flow. So what uh, I have shown here on the address is that I have some local IP that could be my own uh, computer at home, which is communicating with three different remote uh, servers uh, one could be just uh, one, it's, uh, one uh, session uh, and one flow, but to another I could communicate, if I'm communicating to different ports, I would also be communicating with different flows. So even with this definition, I could have multiple flows going to and from the same machine. And quite often uh, you would discuss, for example, in a web browsing session where you are getting um, the web page, but it's broken into objects, then you can discuss, is this one flow that you have all the information or would it be different flows? But in case, even if it is, uh, you can say, triggered by the same, if the conversation is using different ports, according to our definition here, that would be different flows. Um, so 
within the flow, we will then try to distinguish between a malicious flow and a non-malicious flow. And the, the statistics or the features that we can use to describe the different flows could be some of those that are listed here. So number of ingoing packets, number of outgoing packets, average packet links, links of first packet, social number of bytes, protocol used, and so on. Um, of course, you can also use uh, IP addresses and port numbers to describe the flows. But as we'll get back to in a moment, we have to be quite careful not to, uh, uh, yeah, not to introduce bias into our, our data. So based on what I've been saying now about flows um, and about detection at different levels, please take quiz number 12 and then see you soon. Thanks. So welcome to part 7 on the basic module in network security. In the last lecture, we looked at how internet traffic could be described and how we could, uh, which features we could use to describe traffic flows. Now we'll be looking into how we can use machine learning to distinguish between malicious and non-malicious traffic. But first of all, I will give an introduction to the basic principles of machine learning. So machine learning algorithms can be used to distinguish traffic if there is actually a difference. So we need to be able to use our features and based on these features that there actually is a, a difference between the malicious and non-malicious traffic. If there is no difference uh, in the traffic, um, so if the same if flow with the same descriptions could be malicious or non-malicious, of course we cannot see a difference between them. Uh, and therefore it is very important that we select the right features, uh, so the right, um, yeah, the right way to describe the traffic. In the, in the example here, I will be showing a basic principle of machine learning used and whether and whether a uh, used in the decision of whether we should drive a bike to go to work or school. And so again we have some attributes or some features. So here they are the weather and they can descri be described through um, the weather condition. Is it sun, is it snow, is it raining? We have a distance to cover, so that's a continuous um, value. We are we running late, yes or no, and the fuel tank which is empty or full. And of course you can discuss whether these are the correct features and you can also discuss whether the values are correct. But this is something we need to select before we apply the algorithm. So based on this description, then we take, in, then we take a look at some um, labeled data. Um, so this is what is called supervised learning. Um, so when we have the labeled data, we have a number of observations. So like the first line, observation is it's sunny, there is a distance of five kilometers. Uh, we are running late, yes, and we have a full fuel tank. So in that, in that case, we note that here it, we realized that the right decision was to bike. I don't know why this was the right decision, but this is something I need to have in my, in my data set. So what I feed into my uh, algorithm is first of all, a list of observations and then the true value. So for traffic, that would be a list of features that describe a particular flow and then whether it's malicious or non malicious. So of course, in order to construct this data set, I need to have the knowledge in order to make the right decision. So for the biking, it could be what I actually did. And for the traffic, it, it would be some uh, manual or automated analysis saying this was clean or this was not clean traffic. So based on the observations, I can build a decision tree as what is uh, provided here. And I can use that for, um, for making decisions of the future. Um, so um, what I want to do is that I both want to train my classifier and I want to test that my classifier is actually working. So in order to do this, I first use a set of training data in order to train the algorithm. And afterwards, I'm having a set of test data, which are also correctly labeled, but I don't feed the label into the algorithm, so to speak. So after the, after the algorithm has been tra trained, I build my tree. There are also other ways to do it but I assume that I'm building my tree. Um, then I'm trying to feed my test data in to see what decisions my tree is ending up with. And then I can compare the results from going through the tree with my true labeling. And if there is a good fit, then I have a good algorithm. And if there is a bad fit, then probably I have a bad algorithm. Uh, of course, it's important to use different uh, data sets for training and testing. 
because if I use the same data, I would get pretty good results. So it's important that I show to my tree some observations that I have not seen before. I would also say that it's challenging to find good data sets for training and testing, and that is something that we will cover in the next video. Um, so, um, to say it shortly, uh, what we need is that we need correctly classified data set of both um, malicious and non-malicious traffic. It should be representative of botnet behavior, and it should also be representative of normal traffic without botnet behavior. So if it isn't representative, it's not going to work in the real life afterwards. Um, and uh, I will now be looking at some of the challenges we experience uh, when we try to obtain this. Um, in fact, I would say that we don't know exactly if we can actually consider botnet traffic to be a group that is different from all the other groups. And you can discuss whether you should say, okay, we have good traffic here, we have bad traffic here, or if you actually need to divide it into more different categories. But that's a, that's a research topic and it's quite a, an elaborate discussion to go into. And so it's all about the data. So I would say that it's a challenge to find correctly labeled data set. Uh, we need to have data sets that contain no malicious traffic. Um, that could be something we could obtain from a university or company network, but it's still hard to tell that it is actually non-malicious. Also, we need to have data sets that contains not only clean traffic, but also malicious traffic, and we need to know the right labelings. So if we look at a lot of traffic, for example, from an internet service provider, we would not know the labels, so we would have to go manually through huge amounts of data in order to see it. Um, and, uh, and if we're using a more automated approach, we might introduce errors in our, in our uh, labelling, and with errors in the labelling, we'll of course also have errors in the training and in the testing. Um, so we need to find a way of getting that, and that is something we will be, we'll be discussing in more depth in the next lecture. So thank you so much for listening. Now it's time to take quiz number 13. Welcome to part 8 of the Network Security module. Here we'll be looking at how to obtain the good data. So um, as we discussed before, finding correctly labeled malware data is really hard from the real environment because we don't, uh, we don't know how we can find it and we don't know how we can classify it. And definitely it's hard to find enough data that it is representative. So one way of doing it is to build what is demonstrated here, a honeypot or a honey net where we have machines that we infect or let infect and then see how they behave. And so as a starting point, the honeypot would be a more or less closed environment where we can run the malware in a controlled fashion. But as also illustrated on the figure here, we do need, in order to observe how the traffic looks like, we do need some kind of internet access in order to see how they interact with the command and control servers. That's one part. Here we have that we have the malicious data set that we can do in the honeypot, but somehow we need to mix the malicious data set from the honeypot with the benign traffic that we have from another network. And we need to do it in a way that you cannot easily differentiate between them. So for example, if I just had my local data and my, uh, uh, with the malware, and then my non-malicious data and I mix it, I could easily see it based on IP addresses would be different. Maybe uh, there would be all different patterns if I had more TCP or UDP traffic in one than another. Uh, so um, we have to make sure that we don't introduce any bias in the data when you do it like this. Um, so what I've written here is that we have to make sure that there are no specific characteristics that would be interpreted wrongly as specific to malicious or benign traffic. Another example of that could be if I had very short communication times in my honey pot because it's mainly a local network, and then I would have a short time between uh, sending packets and receiving acknowledgement. That would look different in a real network, and then the system could wrongly interpret it as uh, if communication with a short delays would be malicious and long delays would be non-malicious. Um, also, we should be aware that we kind of lose information when we're doing this. For example, bot-generated traffic cannot be assumed to be independent of all kinds of traffic. It could be that I have a specific bot which works only if I'm using a, a web browser at the same time, and therefore just mixing the data set 
uh, I'm losing that uh, connection between the behavior or the human behavior or the system's behavior and and um, and what is generating or not generating the the partner traffic. And also, just to mention that sometimes you can discuss what should be labeled malicious and non-malicious. So you have a, you might have a botnet that initially, or an infected machine, which initially just check, am I connected to the internet? Can I make a Google request? Or can I check if the Windows timestamp uh, server is available? And that might not in itself be a malicious or harmful activity, but would we consider it malicious because it's initiated by a uh, uh, a malicious piece of software, that's a good question. Um, so if it is one request, maybe not. If it is 10 requests, when do, where is the border between malicious and non-malicious traffic? That's also something that is non-trivial. Uh, so once we have the data set with malicious data and the data set with the non-malicious data, one way of mixing it is really by mapping it together. So as shown here, I have um, uh, two kind of traffic. I have my um, bot trace file, which is uh, done locally, and then I have a larger network where I have a background traffic trace file, which I believe is non-malicious. So on the ne next slide, I will show how these can be mapped together. So here I, I see the, my infected machine, and I take um, all, the, um, all the traffic from the infected machine, and then I map it until one of the machines I had creating my background traffic. So that mapping could be done by taking the IP uh, addresses and just changing the IP address. And similarly, I would have another infected machine, uh, so I could have two, and they could be mapped into, into different machines of the, um, of the background traffic. In this way, I would get end out with a traffic trace that would contain both malicious and non-malicious traffic, and the uh, uh, malicious traffic would come from computers who were also generating enormous, no, a normal uh, non-malicious traffic. But still I have to be aware not to introduce any bias um, uh, in the way I do it, for example, uh, by, this, uh, by this timing issue. So how do we generate these malicious data sets? It's something I did uh, touch upon very shortly by mentioning the honeypot. Um, one uh, one uh, example is what we call AU Honigia, uh, where we are trying to handle some of the challenges that we uh, that we experience. First of all, the bot should be brought to believe that it's actually part of a working network, because if it doesn't, if it would just leave the computer and has no human human interaction with the computer, no web browsing, and no use of other programs, etc., the bot code might identify that something is wrong, that uh, it might. Uh, uh, interpret this as it is in a closed environment and therefore it would behave differently than if it was on a normal computer. So again keep in mind that those doing the botnet uh, are also trying to make sure that if we try to study the behavior, if we uh, install it in order to, to run a honeypot, that it doesn't behave as usual. Also it should be secure, uh, secure from the outside world uh, so even if we only allow small amounts of traffic, such as command and control traffic, we should make sure that we don't harm anyone else, both for legal and for ethical reasons. Um, and it should be possible to operate, monitor and control the system without too much work. So it should be as automatized as possible. Uh, in the setup we have here in Auburn University, we have been running up to 300,000 different kind of malware, or different malware samples, at least some of them are very much alike. But in order to run this large amount of malware, we have to make sure that we can do it efficiently and automatically. Um, therefore, it should also be, be easy to reset infected machines to wipe them in order to run new experiments. Um, then I will say um, a little bit more about Honeyjar in the next presentation. And already now say uh, give credits to the master students who have done such a large part of the work um, with the setup that we have. And this is something we will look into in the next video. So for now, please take quiz number 14 and see you again uh, shortly. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, see you soon. Welcome to Network Security Basic Module, part number 9, at the last part. Here we'll show a little bit about the Alba University Honigdjar project, which is mainly run by students. Uh, uh, 
but which has given us a lot of insights into how botnets operate. So what we have here is really a malware testing environment consisting of three main components. First of all, uh, if we start from the, from the right side, there is a test environment where we are able to execute malware and uh, run it to see how it behaves. Um, the test environment contains both inmates um, and some infrastructure that emulates the internet. Uh, then we have a containment part, which makes sure that we don't send any harmful um, traffic out to the, to the real internet, but still allows to have some of the necessary access, for example, so we can observe the command and control traffic. And finally, we have the analysis part, where we can collect and analyze the data, for example, using them for training and testing the machine learning algorithms that I mentioned before. Um, so the test environment it contains, uh, so if we start on this uh, right side of the figure again, uh, the test environment contains a number of machines, pieces, and as well as virtual machines, which we can infect. Uh, in order to make sure that our malware is actually behaving as it is in the real world, we have also done some automatized scripts for emulating normal user behavior. Uh, and by saying normal user behavior, that's really something, some simple internet browsing that we open our browser, go to Google, search some words in a dic dictionary, click on a link, um, close down the web browser, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, we also have a Facebook account, so we can open the web browser, go to Facebook, log in with a specific account for the purpose, log out, and go out again. Moreover, to avoid that we have too much traffic to the outside world, we have implemented a DNS server and a Windows Network Connectivity Indicator Service server, so we don't have to. Uh, so these are, are typically used by botnets, and we can, um, in this way, we can reply to requests and and show them that they are live and online without actually having to uh, to connect to to servers or machines outside our own network. So that's part of minimizing the amount of traffic that we are sending out to the internet. And actually, we, have, we also can do a bit more things and we are constantly working on improving this part. Um, yeah. um, so the possibility to control the, the inmates from a central machine is also important. So you can easily clean the machines in order to start new experiments and we can easily uh, install and execute different kind of malware. In fact, this is not so trivial because when we are working with malware, we have to make sure that our that our central computer in the system doesn't accidentally become infected. Then about the containment part, we that's a component, as I said, that ensures that we can study the botnets without harming others. Um, one way of doing it is that by default, all outgoing traffic is filtered, so we block it, we don't allow it, but we can allow some connections um, based on a whitelisting. So when we know that it's harmless, which can be decided manually or semi-automatic or automatic, when we decide that, okay, this traffic is harmless, then we can let it through. I will show uh, uh, in the next slide how this can be actually done. Um, for the other parts, uh, this, is, this module, as well as everything else, is still under the development. And um, uh, one of the things that we really would like to improve on is to automatize this assessment of which traffic can be allowed to leave the system. So here we can see an example of how this can be done. So this is a normal TCP handshake. So usually when the inmate would be communicating with the command and control server, setting up a TCP connection would be that you send a SYN packet, a SYN ACK, and an ACK. So that's a basic TCP three-way handshake. Um, what we do is that we have implemented a handshake module which takes the connection so whenever we, we get the request, um, we stop it in the handshake module, but we send a reply back so the inmate believes that this is a general, genuine reply and continue conne uh, making the connection. Then we can see on the packets, on the first packet in the connection, we can assess, is this harmless or not harmless? Currently this is a manual approach, but it can be semi-manual as well. And then we decide, okay, it's non-malicious, like sending a nick, then we send a re reset packet back in order for the connection to be reset. And then the inmate will try to create the connection once again. A drawback of doing this is, of course, it's a manual process. 
It's also a drawback that resetting the connection might be seen from the bot as a sp suspicious behavior, and he or she might not uh, try to establish a connection again. Or, even worse, might not try to establish the connection um, exactly as it would have been otherwise. So here we would like to be able to keep this connection kind of in the air, and when we see that the connection is genuine, uh, that then we can uh, let it through by uh, um, by replaying the traffic uh, towards the IRC server. Okay, it's a little technical, but I hope it, may, it makes sense. Uh, in addition to the handshake module, we actually also have uh, web servers and so on in the internal network to make sure that if a web website is requested, we can send something back. It might not be the website that they did request, but we can at least show that we are online. Uh, for the monitoring part, um, we are able to monitor all the network activity. Here we have a challenge in the real life, because if we are working on a real interface, let's say it's a 10 gigabit interface, or, or even uh, 4 times 10 gigabit interface, what it could be, then it's really a lot of data to um, to work on. And even though we don't, when we study the, the network traffic, we don't need all the payload information, but we still have to process uh, and remove the information that we don't need. So here there is um, there is a big challenge in handling the, amount, the large amount of data. So that was a short introduction to our AU Honey Jar with the components we have, the test environment, the containment, and the data analysis. Now, please take quiz number 15. And since this is the last lecture, then after quiz number 15, you can take the final quiz, and then you're done with this module. Thank you very much for following the module, and um, uh, hope to see you again another time.